Welcome to The Gary Mel Show, a program designed to enhance mental, physical, and spiritual well-being through science and the wisdom of the ages. Let us take you on a journey of empowerment. Sit back, relax, and get ready to change your life for good. that I've been terrorized as a gay man into believing things about HIV and AIDS that are not provable. It was just a crazy construct in the beginning. The original definition of AIDS doesn't have any resemblance to the current definition of AIDS. That's not an epidemic. The number of cases reported went up epidemically, you know, exponentially, because the number of tests that was done went up exponentially. It follows a long-standing tradition of basically dumping our abandoned drugs onto the third world. It's really society that's killing these people in general, and modern medicine that's killing them in particular. I believe I'm alive after 20 years of being HIV positive because I didn't take AZT or any anti-AIDS drug. As long as AZT remains on the market, we continue to be betrayed. I think there is a, a, a severe crisis in science as a whole and in medical sciences in particular. They don't question anything. The entire AIDS establishment is absolutely guilty of some hideous sins, and everybody's been fooled. That's hard to believe, see? It's, it's like, no, it can't be. I would say we have acquired information deficiency syndrome or a scandal. We maintain that HIV is a big mistake, possibly one of the biggest mistakes of the 20th century. How is this virus causing AIDS? How is it causing the depletion of immune cells when you can't even find it? Nobody has ever seen HIV. We have seen diagrams of HIV. We've seen posters, all of those with drawings of HIV. But this is only theoretical, the way that it ought to be. When two different parties look at the same data and come to different conclusions, it's no longer scientific. Actually, AIDS is a religion of these people. They believe in this virus. There is so much money being pumped into AIDS that people have no incentive whatsoever to see the truth. Maintaining this industry, maintaining this whole idea that there's this epidemic pending and that HIV causes AIDS is a major public relations uh, process in the United States. If a hypothesis fails to produce results, that we have to reconsider that hypothesis. I'm in the Museum of the City of New York. There is a 20-year retrospective on AIDS. In this retrospective, if you look around, there's beautiful posters and very poignant and, and touching photographs and stories of people who have been afflicted with AIDS. Also, all along the walls are little charts, chronologies of events, like when AIDS was discovered and then the test, the antibody test, that people should be tested to determine do they have this deadly disease. That there is hope, not for a cure, but instead put time on your side. Take AZT or other antiretroviral cocktails. That's the messages. I'm Gary Nall. And I'd like to open up a dialogue, a dialogue that allows those who've been excluded from the communication in the war on AIDS to have a forum. These individuals are sincere. They are credentialed, and they have a lot of good questions and challenging statements for those who are absolutely convinced that everything we've been taught about AIDS is right. It is the intent of this program to have a forum for the dissidents. 
the most responsible and reasoned of those individuals, you're now going to have an opportunity to see what their argument is as they try to deconstruct what they consider the myth of AIDS. Professor David Rasnick, one of the developers of the protease inhibitors commonly used for persons with AIDS, came from a scientific established background. He has done extensive research on the subject of AIDS and is now one of the most outspoken AIDS dissidents. The best evidence against the HIV hypothesis is that there is no evidence for it. In the vast scientific medical literature, over 100,000 journals published so far on HIV AIDS, we cannot find anywhere in this vast literature the evidence that HIV causes AIDS, that AIDS is a contagious disease, or that it even sexually transmitted. If this had been shown that AIDS is caused by HIV, we should know who these benefactors of humanity are by name. These would be candidates for the Nobel Prize. But uh, I challenge you, any American, journalist, scientist, to come up with the names of these individuals who we should revere and should honor with awards and things. And I think you will find that you won't be able to come up with it. In 1984, Luke Montagna wrote in Nature, quote, all available data are consistent with the virus being the causative agent of AIDS, end of quote. But in 1985, he expressed an opinion which is impossible to reconcile with the HIV theory, I quote, this syndrome occurs in a minority of infected persons who generally have, have in common a past history of antigenic stimulation, that means immune stimulation, and of immune depression before HIV infection. In other words, Montagna was claiming that the, that the cause of the immune depression was coming after the effect, which is contradictory. Perhaps Montagna was hedging his bets even at that early stage. Fourteen years ago, Dr. Peter Duisberg was the lone voice in the world of AIDS dissonance. At that time, the molecular biologist, world-renowned virologist, and UCLA professor began asking a question that seemed like heresy in his day. Was it possible that we were wrong when we equated HIV with AIDS? Gallo uh, tried in hundreds of patients to find that virus and came up with a sample that he borrowed from a French colleague. I know Gallo, and Gallo is, a, is, is not a bad virologist. He would have found a virus that is there at concentrations where it could cause a disease. But Gallo proved to the scientific world with this what proved to be a nearly a scandal in the scientific history. He claimed the virus from a colleague as his own he proved that it was very, very difficult, even for an excellent laboratory, as Gallo was operating it at the NIH, to isolate a virus from an AIDS patient. There has never been viremia, which means the blood flooded with a whole cell-free infectious viruses. If HIV were actually doing anything, making people sick, there would indeed be viremia, meaning millions of whole viruses uh, per milliliter plasma. In fact, nobody has ever observed even one of them. HIV is so clever that it knows to cause Kaposi sarcoma in gay men. 98% of all Kaposi sarcoma is in gay men. HIV knows to cause tuberculosis uh, and, and wasting in IV drug users. And it knows to cause uh, diarrhea and candidiasis or thrush in hemophiliacs. It's not just Peter Duisberg or some heretics or some outsiders who criticize the failure of our war against AIDS. It's the orthodoxy itself. They advertise they have not saved one single life with 60 to 80 billion dollars. That means in conventional scientific logic there could very well be something profoundly wrong with the basic hypothesis with the basic approach that we use against AIDS. 
Some of the most vocal critics of the HIV equals AIDS hypothesis are a group of Australian researchers led by Dr. Eleni Papadopoulos Eliopoulos. In their breakthrough report, the scientists raised serious questions about the accuracy of HIV antibody tests, and more importantly, the very relationship of HIV to AIDS. In fact, in their newest work, they are questioning, has HIV even been isolated? As far as we are concerned, if one goes through the, all the HIV literature which exists today, I think one will find it bold and incredible to still believe that there is proof for the existence of HIV. When a particle looks like a retrovirus, you have to isolate it, then put it in another culture, show that the cells in the secondary culture produce particles exactly like the particles from which they originated. But the two particles from the two cultures are exactly the same, can be shown only by determining their constituent proteins and RNA. So isolation is extremely important to prove that the particle is a retrovirus. From the mid-70s until 1984, when the so-called official cause of AIDS was found, it was shown that many individuals within the gay community were suffering from a unique form of gay men's disease. The original theory was that AIDS was caused by a lifestyle. It was in June 81 when the first publication came out, published by the Centers of Disease Control, saying five men had PCP and two of them died even being treated with Septrim this last uh, or the strongest uh, antibiotic available. AIDS was first identified among gay men in 1981 who practiced certain lifestyle behaviors. They, according to New York Times, on July 3rd, 1981, tended to have upwards of 2,000 sexual contacts a year and used a lot of aphrodisiacal drugs, including poppers, amyl nitrite, a very dangerous substance that gay men had been inhaling in epidemic proportions since the early 1970s. And with regard to the sexual activity, you don't need to be moralistic to say that, you know, gosh, you have 2,000 sex partners a year, you develop a laundry list of infectious diseases, venereal diseases, that can do a lot of damage over the long term to your immune system. Doctors and scientists looking at this phenomenon early on said, gosh, they do a lot of drugs, they have a laundry list of venereal diseases. The combination of these factors might well be enough to knock their immune systems for a real loop. They took tons of antibiotics to treat the perpetual infections they would get by having a lot of different sex partners. And between the drugs and the infections and the antibiotics and the treatments, plus just partying all the time and being very run down, it's really a wonder that they didn't get sick sooner. One of the leading critics of the war on AIDS is Professor Stefan Leica a German biologist and virologist who questions the isolation of HIV and many contradictions and lack of proper scientific reasoning behind the HIV theory, including the wrong form of treatment for a person with AIDS. The background of, of AIDS, and we are absolutely sure about this, is the antibiotic resistance catastrophe, killing people in hospitals like flies, because there are no antibiotics available without resistance in some bacteria. So in a state of immune suppression in the hospital, a lot of people come down with, with bacterial infections. This is called sepsis because of blood poisoning. When too much bacteria are growing and producing toxins, this is going to kill them in a state of reduced immunity. And we had these problems already in the beginning of the 70s. There have been kind of emergency conferences dealing with the problem because they were scared that uh, resistance would spread and uh, they have no antibiotica available. So they invented a very strong antibioticum. And it's, it's, it's not antibioticum to say it's, it's pure chemotherapy. It's a double folic acid antagonist. The good old sulfonamide and two of them put together would kill every microbe. But the problem is 
they were scared that in the gay scene, new resistance would develop and spread into the population. I mean, before 1984, when it was announced that HIV was the cause of AIDS, or the probable cause of AIDS, it was sort of more of a level playing field, in a sense, because viral causation hadn't been proved. And, you know, scientists and clinicians were looking at more of a, a, a multifactorial model, maybe an environmental model, or even a toxicological model to explain um, the phenomena of AIDS. Many of the early AIDS cases were very, very sick. They were close to death when they got their diagnosis. Uh, some of them had Kaposi sarcoma, which is a poorly understood affliction of the blood vessels. At the time, they thought it was a cancer. Now it's known it's not. But they were given aggressive forms of chemotherapy, which had the result of killing virtually all of them. Uh, the doctors later realized it was a mistake, only to the extent they stopped it, although the medical profession never quite admits they've made a mistake. The AIDS definition was there before, saying if you have PCP and if you have uh, 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 KS, uh, caused by, uh, by, by nitrites, as well, because the nitrites are transformed into NO only in the smallest uh, vessels because the partial pressure of oxygen is high enough to perform this transformation and NO is a very potent growth stimulant. So we have this uh, uh, neoplasia and hyperplasia in the endothelia and this condition is called uh, a Kaposi uh, sarcoma. It was on April 23, 1984 that Margaret Heckler announced to the world that the cause of AIDS had been found, namely HIV. Dr. Robert Gallo's colleagues said that his research made possible a blood test for AIDS and that a vaccine would be ready for testing in two or three years. That was in 1984. AIDS started partly when they said that it's possible to, uh, to measure the, the, the strengths of the immune system um, analyzing or counting T4 cells, the so to say uh, helper cells. But that's not, imp that's not possible. And it has already been published in 81 in the journal JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association, saying that it makes no sense to count subsets even of lymphocytes because there was never a correlation. It could be high or low and people are healthy or ill, it doesn't matter. So this was already known. But the problem was in, uh, at this time already that in, in medicine people would not look to the facts but what what is possible to sell on the market because it was the year 1977 when it became possible to patent uh, medical techniques. So they wouldn't care if there's any uh, a clinical meaning behind those measurements, but they just sold it on the market. And the model of immunology would say at this time, ah, if the immune system is weak, so cancer would appear. And that has been fundamentally mistaken, and it was wrong when they said it in 81. They knew it already in 1980 that this has been wrong. The immune surveillance theory of cancer came into existence when the war against cancer failed. About 1970, uh, major cancer research laboratories were, were passionately involved in attempts to demonstrate that uh, our, uh, retroviruses were uh, associated with uh, human cancer, uh, they really didn't get very far, not far at all. And somehow, uh, around 1980-81, when the first cases of AIDS were reported, uh, this came to these groups uh, as a, at least one way out of the mostly negative uh, results they had obtained for about 10 years before. So the AIDS research, I regard it as a, an extension of an earlier effort to demonstrate retrovirus in human cancer. They were working with the test, uh, with cells in the test tube and say, look, we have high activity of reverse transcription, therefore a virus must be inside and the virus is the cause of cancer. But the nature of cancer is much different and when they found reverse transcription everywhere they gave up the idea that retroviruses would cause cancer and they were not speaking about it anymore but wasted 
billions of dollars into this and developed chemotherapy based on this idea that the, the multiplication of genetic material, and they were thinking of the viruses, should be blocked. So they developed uh, molecules which were incorporated in a growing chain of uh, newly to build up uh, genetic material and which would kill the build up or prevent the build up of uh, this genetic molecule and the cell eventually has to die. The idea of retroviruses in cancer is long over, but the chemotherapy still is there because it's sold and uh, they have no idea why, no rational explanation why they are using chemotherapy. In 1984, Robert Gallo comes along, gives a press conference and says, hey, all of these diseases are caused by a virus. Here's his theory. HIV kills T cells, decimates the T cell population, causing acquired immune deficiency which is, opens the gateway to infection with any number of opportunistic infections, 30 at this point. This is what we call the syndrome of AIDS-defining diseases. Problem is, if all these diseases among these populations were caused by a virus, one would think that these, you know, this constellation of diseases, this syndrome, would spread from the original risk populations into the general population. That's what infectious diseases do. They spread out of you know, the original risk populations. Problem is, through 1992, this simply wasn't the case. After 10 years of this so-called raging AIDS epidemic, over 90% of AIDS patients cumulatively remained within those original risk groups. And of those remaining 10%, you have to consider that those included all homosexuals who didn't care to admit their sexuality to their doctor, all IV drug users who didn't care to admit their drug habits to their doctor, and all infants AIDS patients. So you've got a, a, a disease that's really restricted to certain risk populations and it's not spreading. Hence it's terribly unlikely that this disease could be caused by a virus. In science, certain rules must be followed for any agent to be considered a causative factor in disease. The first rule is that an agent that is going to be blamed for a disease should be able to be isolated from each and every case of the disease. That is not true in HIV and AIDS. In my judgment, and to the best of my reviewing of the current literature on that subject, uh, I've never seen a clear demonstration, I mean, a, of, a, of a direct isolation of HIV from patients. I've seen some evidence uh, of uh, virus particles uh, observed on occasionally in very complex uh, culture systems. But this, to me, is no evidence for direct isolation from the patients. It's been isolated by thousands of laboratories throughout the world. It's probably the best studied virus of any viral pathogen in the history of human diseases. So to say that it doesn't exist and it hasn't been isolated is, is beyond preposterous. What AIDS researchers call virus isolation, or HIV isolation in this case, consists of two things. They will get their tissue culture where this HIV is supposed to be growing and they'll check it for reverse transcriptase, which is an enzyme that was supposed to be specific or only exclusively found in retroviruses. And if they find reverse transcriptase in the tissue culture, they say, aha, we have now isolated HIV. Another thing they'll do is they'll check the tissue culture for a P24 antigen, which is one of the proteins that supposedly belongs to HIV. Both of these things, reverse transcriptase and the P24 protein, are about as nonspecific as you can get. In fact, reverse transcriptase can be found in any number of different places. Normal cells contain reverse transcriptase and under certain conditions they will reverse transcribe RNA into DNA. The hepatitis B virus also contains reverse transcriptase. And most importantly of all, the cells of people with leukemia have also been shown to have reverse transcriptase activity. And why this is important is that every HIV culture, starting with Robert Gallo, were co-cultured with leukemia tissue. You couldn't just take the blood from somebody with AIDS and culture it in the tissue culture all by itself because 
nothing would grow. They couldn't find any HIV that way. So they had to co-culture it with cancer cells or tissue from people with leukemia. We know what is reverse transcription. That's a repair of a mechanism of the ends of the chromosomes. Yeah? And uh, therefore we have high activity in cancer cells or Montagnier embryonic cells. But Montagny never said that he found the, the virus of, of, of AIDS. He said this could be a, probably an effect and uh, to be carefully studied. Now of all the years and the decades that have gone by where people have studied retroviruses, researchers have concluded that they all share certain common characteristics. First of all, they have a certain density which causes them to band at the 1.16 grams per milliliter density gradient. Their morphological characteristics have to fulfill certain requirements. First of all, they have to be round. They can have a diameter of between 100 and 120 nanometers, no more, no less. They have to have dense cores, and they have to have spikes or knobs on the surface. Well, in terms of AIDS, we didn't even find any retroviruses there in the density gradient. In fact, 80% of the material that ends up there is cellular material, just garbage really from the cells of the tissue culture. And the remaining 20% may or may not be a retrovirus. Just because it ends up there doesn't mean you've proved it's a retrovirus. If you want, you can spend a lot of fortune and take electron microscopic pictures, which we did at the beginning, and which other labs did at the beginning, which there are hundreds of them. Oh, yeah, of course. There's, I would say by now, thousands of pictures of HIV. We have drawers full, stacks full, this high of electron micrographs. Okay, pictures of the virus. So, but banded once material. you picture, once you... Banded material, 1.16. No, you can look at banded material. You can see obvious retrovirus. Do you know what a retrovirus looks like? I have a picture showing what a density gradient of pure virus should, should look like. I mean, the way that you determine if something is pure is to stare at one object, take in its appearance, and then look at every other object around it and make sure that they're the same. And you can see that mostly this is pure particles. There are some where these are arrowed which are slightly different, and this is not unusual. However, in March 1997, in, in virology, and published by Glushenkov, from, from, from France, the first pictures of purified virus were revealed to the world. You can see from this that this material is anything but pure. In fact, the authors of this paper concede that this so-called pure virus is predominantly cellular material. The particles that were found in these two 1997 studies did not fit the characteristics of retroviruses. They had no knobs on them, and they were the wrong size. In fact, the volumes of the particles in these studies were either anywhere from 50% greater to 750% greater than the volume that a normal retrovirus particle really ought to be. Hey, we'll be back. This program is not over. A lot more to come. Join me next week as we continue our exploration on these health issues. I'm Gary Nall. Have a nice week.